Hello and welcome to this tutorial on dynamic NAT. Now this is the second type of NAT you should know and it's really only slightly different than the static NAT configuration and how it works. Some of the configurations we introduce with static NAT are going to remain the same for dynamic and then we add just a few new configurations. One of those new configurations is going to include the use of an access list. So this is also a good tutorial as a follow-up to the access list materials because it illustrates the many uses of an access list and how you can use them not just for blocking or permitting traffic but also for identifying traffic for specific purposes like NATing. Okay, so let's get started. First, let's take a look at what remains the same from our static tutorial. All of the terms we're using, inside local, inside global, outside local, and outside global, they all remain the same. They still refer to the same things. All, the de all of the definitions for each of these terms are the same. And in fact, whenever you talk about NATing, these terms are always used. So these don't change at all. Also, just like static NAT, dynamic NAT is going to allocate a unique IP for every inside device that needs to be NATed. All right, so that remains the same as well. And then as for configurations, we still have to identify an inside and an outside NAT interface, just like before. So all these things remain the same. What changes is, even though we're going to allocate a unique public IP for all of our private IPs, it's going to no longer be a one-to-one -one mapping like we did earlier. It's no longer static. Rather, we're going to be doing this for an entire group of IPs. So we're going to configure both a group of inside locals and also a group of inside globals. So first we need a group of public IPs. These will be our inside global IPs which will represent our private or the inside local IPs. So this range will do just fine. And this group by the way is referred to as a pool and this is a NAT pool and we'll see how that comes up in the configuration in just a second. So after we identify our group of public IPs, we now need to identify the group of inside local IPs that will require NAT. So instead of just singling out this one PC like we did for static, now we're interested in, in figuring out or identifying the entire subnet if in fact all of the devices on that subnet needed to be NATed. Okay? And when we identify this traffic, that's where the access list comes into play. And we'll see how that works in just a minute. So everything really remains the same as we've already learned, except now we're, we're dealing with pools of IPs. So basically, our PC is going to source a, a, a packet, the router is going to get it, and based on its configuration and the access list, it'll say, okay, this IP is coming from this range of, of IP addresses, which I'm interested in for NAT, and then uh, based on that, I'm going to choose one of the IPs from this pool of public IPs and then I'll go ahead and I'll update the source address with the public IP and then I'll go ahead and route that packet out to the far end, out to its destination. So this is a dynamic process now because you no longer have the one-to-one -one mappings. The IPs are going to be dynamically assigned when they're needed. So it's possible that a user one day has 201 2.2.1 but then 24 hours later when that NAT translation expires because they're not permanent and they go ahead and initiate another conversation with the web server they could get a totally different IP address on the public side. Okay? Let's look at the configurations on how to make this actually work. First I want to show you the static NAT configuration which we've already gone over. You'll remember IP NAT inside, meaning the uh, inside network traffic is what we're interested in. We're interested in changing the source IP address. This is a static translation, and then we have our inside IP and our outside IP. Now with dynamic NAT, our configuration changes. Our IP NAT command still lists the inside because we're still interested in capturing traffic from the inside network, and we're going to change the source IP uh, again this time as well. But we're getting rid, get, getting rid of the static translation. So that's gone now. And you'll notice that the inside local 
IP address is now replaced with this list one. This is where we're identifying which access list uh, will identify our inside local IPs. Okay, and then our inside global IP address is now changed to a pool, and that pool has a name. You can name it anything you want. I named it blue. So here's our, our access list. And we've gone over access lists already. What I will point out is that this number has to match what you have configured in your NAT statement. And then obviously the range of IPs should reflect what you're interested in NATing. Now in terms of the NAT pool, we introduce a new command. And this is IP NAT pool. You can see it has a name and obviously that name has to match what you have configured in your IP NAT statement. And then quite simply, we list the first IP in the range and the last IP in the range and then the subnet mask that they belong to. Okay, so that's our new configuration. We get rid of this static configuration entirely and we now have three lines. Of course, we still have to identify our inside and our outside interfaces. That's going to be a standard with all of the different types of NAT we talk about. Okay, so that's the overview of the configurations. Let's jump on a router and actually make this happen. On router A, we'll jump into configuration mode and we can begin wherever we want. We can create the NAT pool first, the access list first. It doesn't really matter. We just need them all configured in order to make it work. I'm going to start with the NAT command itself. So, like we went over in the diagram, access list 1 is going to identify my source traffic and the NAT pool named blue is going to identify the public IPs I want to use. Next I'll create the access list and I'm going to use the permit parameter. When we're using an access list for NAT, we want to identify certain traffic, like our subnet that our PC lives in. When we want to allow traffic to be NATed, we use the permit command. And if we don't want a certain subnet to be NATed, then we can use the deny command or rely on the implicit deny of the access list. But keep in mind, we're not blocking traffic from passing into the interface and then being routed and, and potentially routed out a, a, an outgoing interface. We're not blocking the traffic. We're only using the access list to identify the traffic we're interested in. Okay? So, the traffic we're interested in is this subnet. And then finally, we need to create the NAT pool named blue, the first IP in the range, the last IP in the range, and then the subnet mass that they belong to. We're almost done. Now we just need to identify our inside and outside interface. Just like in the last tutorial, the subinterface on FA00 is going to be our NAT inside interface. And then likewise, just like last time, our serial interface is going to be our outside NAT interface. So we've identified the inside and the outside networks. Okay, and that's it. Our configuration is done. Let's actually see if it works now. Show IP NAT translations. It's empty, and that's only because our PC on the network hasn't done anything yet. So let's have it ping the web server, which I've just initiated. And if we take a look at the translations table now, we see an entry. It's ICMP, which makes sense because it's, it's ping. And we can see the inside global IP address. The first one in the range was chosen. And then we can see which device on our local area network is actually being NATed. And that's 1.2. Then, of course, we can see the outside global IP where we're actually going, which in this case is the web server.
Let's look at another command which is really useful as well. Show IP NAT statistics. There's a fair amount of information here. Starting at the top, it tells us um, what kind of translations are actually happening. Are they static or are they dynamic? It also tells us which interfaces are the outside and which are the inside. That's pretty helpful. And then we see some hits and misses. Well, this misses here is a little bit misleading. When the router receives a packet, it's first going to check, if, if it's eligible for NATing, it's first going to check the NAT table to see if a translation already exists. If one does exist, then it uses it and it routes the packet on its way. However, if it does not, it's going to increment this counter. And then it knows it has to actually create a NAT translation. So that's all that means. If we go all the way down to the bottom, though, you'll see another misses. That means when the router realizes it, realizes it has to create a NAT translation, but it fails to do so for some reason it cannot, well, then it'll increment this counter, and that actually indicates a failure. So that's the one you want to keep an eye on if you're troubleshooting any NAT problems. If we go up just a bit, you can see the access list we have defined here, uh, as well as the range of IPs that we'll be using for our public IP addresses. Okay, so play around with that command. Um, the more devices you add to your network, the more uh, IPs will be used from your NAT pool, and you can see the utilization, the allocation rate will change. Let's look at one more command. This one, if you're troubleshooting, you may want to clear all of the IP NAT translations in the NAT table. The way to do that is clear IP NAT translations, and to clear all of them, you could put an asterisk. If you want to single one particular translation out, you need to go ahead and take a look at the available parameters. And you can see we have a few here. Um, for our purposes, we're just going to clear all of them. And then I'll show you. Our translations table is now empty. So this could be helpful if you're troubleshooting and you need to, uh, to clear the table because sometimes the NAT table can be huge. Let's go ahead and have the PC initiate a ping again. And if we check out the table now, you can see it is once again populated. So it's useful for troubleshooting. Another good troubleshooting tool is the debug command. So debug IP NAT. Now keep in mind, when you enable any, any type of de debugging on a router, it could really uh, put tremendous uh, strain on the resources on the router, the CPU and, and memory. So be careful when you do this on a production device. Now that NATing is on, we're going to go ahead and get some log entries on the router so let's take a look at some of these. And you can see exactly what's happening here. Take a look at this line. 192.168.1.2, it tells you the source, and it tells you what the source is getting translated to. 201.2.2.1. And then it's giving you the destination. Where is that device going to? 170.7.7.2. So this could be a very helpful tool if you're trying to figure out why one particular device on your network is not NATing properly. Okay, let's summarize what we covered. For configuration commands, we're now using the IP NAT command, and it's pretty much the same as we used it when configuring a static configuration, but here we've replaced the inside local with an access list, and we've replaced the inside global with a pool. Our access list is pretty much the same as what we talked about in the access list tutorials, so nothing new there. And then the NAT pool. We have to give it a name, we have to state the first IP in the range and the last IP in the range, and then state the subnet mask. And that subnet mask has to be correct in terms of including both of those IPs. If one IP is really low and one's really high, and your subnet mask is not big enough to incorporate both of them, the router is going to give you an error. So keep that in mind. And then of course we need to identify our interfaces as always. 
And then we took a look at some good troubleshooting commands. The show IP NAT translations, very helpful. And then we introduced a new one, the show IP NAT statistics command. Finally, if you want to manipulate the IP uh, NAT translations table, you can clear it. You can clear all of them. You can clear some of them. You can clear one of them. You have options there. And then finally, when things are really bad, always use the debug IP NAT command. Keep in mind it could put some strain on your router's resources, so be careful. But it will give you some detailed logging of which IPs are being NATed, what they're being NATed to, and where they're going. Okay, so that's it. That is Dynamic NAT. Thanks for watching.